Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Have Your Cake and Eat It Too. My name is Karen Cohen, and I help people and systems work better together. And sometimes that means that I am an engineering manager, and sometimes that means that I'm a product architect, and sometimes, but not all the times, it means that I get to write a bit of code. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, uh, at Karen underscore Meep. You can tweet at me, and you can complain, and you can recommend some good cake, because unfortunately, um, this talk is not about cake. Um, I work for a company called Wix, and at Wix we have a website building platform, which means that people who don't have a web development background can build their own websites. We also have an app market where we, um, we develop tools for people to run their businesses, so uh, events, booking, CRMs, and a bunch of other stuff that people need. And as I said before, I'd like to start out with an apology. This is not about cake. Um, if you want to talk about cake, I would love to, but later. And um, this talk is about how to make huge changes in your systems. And when I say huge changes, when I say big changes, I mean um, this isn't like refactoring a module. This is more like taking a monolith and breaking it up into microservices. This is like bringing in a new technology. This is making something very, very big happen within your system, within your ecosystem. So um, I joined Wix about four years ago, and I joined as a product architect. And as a product architect, what I need to do is I need to work on integrations. I need to work on APIs, on SDKs, on looking at the system as a whole and making sure that everything runs together smoothly, both on the product level and on the architectural level. And every time I wanted to make a change, people kept pointing me to this thing called the Metasite. And I asked them, what is the Metasite? And they said, Karen, it's the, it's the Metasite. And I was like, okay, sure, yeah, okay. Um, and um, uh, uh, now that I'm older and wiser, I can tell you that um, Metasite is short for, me uh, for site metadata but it is still not very obvious at all. It's not obvious to me and it's not obvious to my team and it's definitely not obvious to our clients and our users and people who have been around um, in the company for a lot longer than we have. Um, so the company exists for about 10 years and it's one of the most basic components, one of the core components that were written when Wix first was founded. And what metadata means to you is not what metadata means to me. What metadata means to Abdul is not what metadata means to Sarah. And what metadata means for this system, for the Metasite, is this. It's a site configuration system. So in order to define a website, I need to know what the URLs are. I need to know who the owner of the site is. I need to know what sort of applications are installed on it and a bunch of other stuff. The list is very, very, very long. Um, and about a year after I joined, we had some issues. A lot of changes were happening around the product. And whenever we would implement one feature, we would hurt another. And we just came to a point where in a certain area of our product, we, in a certain area of our system, we couldn't deliver any new features. Every time we changed one thing, we hurt another, and we simply couldn't move forward. We were stuck. And, and then, so we went, we went up to our managers and, um, and we said, hey manager, like, I can't do anything anymore and I, I can't solve anything and I can't move. And they gave us a gift. They gave us a golden ticket. And they gave us like our most wildest dreams. Um, I mean, if you've ever dealt with legacy systems, then you know that you're looking at this like pile of code and you say to yourself, if I only had a few months of complete silence in like a bunker somewhere in Germany, I could rebuild this thing. I could make it happen and I would make it so, so much better than it is written right now. And so that's what we got. We got a golden ticket from management and they said, okay, 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 take a few months, don't do anything, 
put up a no product managers allowed sign in the, the entrance of your room on the door. You know what, barricade the doors, just don't let anyone in and, and rebuild. And so what we did was we, um, we got everyone in a room all of the people that were involved in our integrations, and that meant um, product managers, and that meant server developers and client developers, and we put them all in a room together. And at that time, which was about, again, four years ago, it was about six people. So we got them all in a room together, and finding a meeting room back then was um, very, very easy. And, um, and we talked about the data flows, and we talked about the integrations, and we talked about the APIs, and we talked about how we were going to do testing for it. And we talked about all these different things, and, um, and it seemed perfect, and we had documentation for everything, for the new flows, and everyone understood them. And, um, and then we set out to work, and between that planning, and the, 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 the testing, and the figuring out, um, the, the ricochets that came back from implementing new data flows and new product flows, we lost touch with our users. We lost touch with our clients. So um, product managers who wanted to implement something new in our system during that time um, got the no product managers allowed sign and went home crying. Um, and developers who wanted to ask about um, new integrations and new APIs that were um, with our system, they were also sent home. Not crying, but very disappointed. And the company was so traumatized by that, that, uh, that, that year that when we had more problems that we needed to solve with the system, Everyone was very, very scared. And we did have a lot of problems. So we had customized APIs. When I say customized APIs, this means that, um, so again, when I say metadata, metadata means different things to different people. And it wasn't really clear what the system does and what kind of metadata it holds, and so, our clients wanted to understand the APIs. So we had an events API, and we had a bookings API, and we had every single API was tailored because people didn't understand what data the system was holding. People didn't understand the, data, the, the product flows that went through the system, so we had to name them in a way that they would understand. Unfortunately, when we built these custom APIs, we didn't really put much effort into documentation. So new people that were coming into Wix, and there were a bunch of them because the company had scaled significantly during that time, um, they needed hand-holding in order to do anything, in order to build anything new or make any changes with our system. And that, again, was everyone. So every single product that came into Wix had to go through us and spend a week with us just to get off the ground. But the biggest problem that we had was that the system, being called metadata, had no clear boundaries. And that means that any one of our clients, any product manager, and any server developer, any client developer, can think or may think that their new product flow needs to go through the system because it's, it's, all, it's metadata, right? It has to do with the other metadata. And what metadata means to you is not what metadata means to me, so obviously when they came into our room and they asked to put in new data flows or new product flows or new data into our database, we had a bit of an issue with that and everything was very emotional and very angsty. Um, Everyone was very upset all the time. And the problem was, was that we wanted to fix it, but, but what could we do now? I mean, we don't want to stop the world. We don't, want to, um, we don't want to stop development throughout the entire company. We want to keep on going. And we didn't really know how to solve that problem. But we did know how to define the different problems that we were experiencing. So we got in a room together and 
we discussed the different facets of the problem that we were seeing. We discussed the APIs and the onboarding and, um, and the triaging of issues, which I didn't even mention, but it was awful. Um, again, all the, all the different hand-holding. And we basically took all the different pieces of the puzzle that the team members see, and we put it in one place. And what we did with that was try and define a vision. Now, this isn't a time-based vision. This isn't, um, this isn't a roadmap. This isn't something that you know, I can say, OK, within six months, I want to be over there, and I want to like, split it up into like, microservices, and I want to have Kafka in the middle, and materialized views, and I want to have all this crap all around. This isn't what this vision is. This vision is. This is how I see the system. This is the ecosystem that I want to create. This is the idea that I want to push forward. And the most important, th the most important thing is, is that it's not binding. Meaning, if before we sat in a room, and we talked about our vision, we talked about a plan, and we made a roadmap, and we talked about implementation, and we talked about the finer details, this vision is something completely different. It's an idea, and it can change at any time, depending on what our clients need and want. It's an ongoing process, meaning that every now and again, we agree that we're going to sit and we're going to plan it again. So what did our vision look like? We defined the roles and responsibilities of our system. That was the first problem that we wanted to address. We wanted to bring down the angst. We wanted to bring down all the emotions in the room. And we wanted to make sure that first and foremost, people understood when they come to us and when they implement things on their end. The second thing we talked about was internal domain modeling. Now, that's a problem that's very specific to us or very specific to a lot of monoliths because when you have so much metadata and you have so many things in, in, in one place and they're not properly defined, then obviously, how do you explain them? The third thing we talked about was terminology. We wanted to start communicating better with our clients. We wanted to be able to explain what the system does. I mean, if we want to if we want to make sure that they know when to come to us and why they come to us, then we need to make sure that they're using the right words when they explain their wants and their needs. And we want to make sure that w when we explain our plans, we use words that they understand. Water. OK, so we had all of that. And, um, and we, we started communicating with, um, with our clients. And this one day, a client comes in, a developer comes in, and he's like, I need this and that and the new API, and I need this and the data flow and that and the data flow. And one of our team members says, OK, OK, OK. I have a few ideas for implementation. And this one is the, the regular way of thinking, and this one can lead us one step closer to our vision. This one can lead us one step closer to where we want to go. And I was like, whoa. He's using everyday decision making to move our process forward, to move our vision forward. This is mind blowing. This is amazing. I was like, I want more of this. I want to create more, um, more moments like this. But how do I do that? How do I make sure that everyone sees what I see? How do I make sure that the rest of the team sees what he sees? Well, first of all, we talked about it within the team about how, to, um, how we're going to change our way of thinking and how to, we're going to create these win-win scenarios. But then that's not enough, right? Because our team is very small and we live in such a larger ecosystem. We live in a company. Right? So we need to communicate that to the people that we work with. But then how do you communicate that? You communicate that by talking to their motivation. 
When you speak to your managers, you talk about the big picture. You talk about where the company as a whole is going, what the industry trends are, what the technological trends are, how we fit into all of that, how we, um, how we make our clients happy, how we make our users happy. You make sure that they are on the same page as you. You make sure that their motivation and your motivation is aligned. And you do the same thing with your clients. In our case, our clients were product managers and developers. So for product managers, they care about the product strategy. They care about the roadmap. They care about where, what new features they are going to be able to answer if we give them these new capabilities. If we make this if architectural change, then we're gonna be able to supply you with a lot more product opportunities. If we bring in this new technology, then we're gonna be able to open doors for your product. If we put in this change and we don't spend a lot of time dealing with urgent matters, then obviously we have more time to deal with feature requests. The one thing that these two or three personas also care about is that, we're not, is that we're not going to bloat feature requests, meaning that if something comes in and it would usually take you two days, suddenly it can't cost two weeks, right? So what you're looking to create is a change of mindset. You're looking to create a situation where everyone is working on all of the different facets of the problem, right? If you're creating a product, there's the facet of the product, but then there's also the facet of the tech that's behind it. There's also the facet of the people that's behind it. And it's your responsibility as a tech leader, as an engineering manager, it's your responsibility to understand all these different facets and make sure that everyone creates these opportunities for change and for growth. And so it's, of course, it's, it's easier said than done, right? I mean, how do I spot these, these win-win opportunities? How do, I, um, like how, do I, how do I make sure that I don't really bloat these features? How do I make sure that after, yes, I've communicated and I've made sure that, um, that people are on my side, but how do I spot those opportunities? So what you're looking to create is a co-evolution. So co-evolution is when two organisms evolve as response to each other. So the tech evolves as response to new feature requests, but the product can evolve as response to tech changes, right? So let's talk about some examples. Some examples we've had in our team were, so as I said before, we, um, we deal with websites. So a product manager comes in and he says, I want to be able to search on a list of websites given the name or given the owner. And um, given that our current system is based on MySQL, the only thing that we could do was offer him a like query. And obviously that's not performant and it would you know, it re would require us to do new development every single time. And what we offered him at that time was, are you willing to let us take out a loan in order to pay you back with interest? Meaning, are you willing to wait a few months, to wait a few weeks for us to put in some Elasticsearch? And then once we put in that elastic search, look at all the feature requests, the future feature requests that we are going to be able to answer once we have that. Does it fit within your product roadmap? Does it fit within your product strategy? He said yes. We said, okay, cool, great. And we set out and we built this new, uh, we, we built this new, this new service, this new product flow and it's really, really great. A second example that I want to discuss is we're now making big changes around applications in our system, in, in the Wix ecosystem. And there's this new project, and, and, and it's a huge project. 
And this would actually be a great opportunity to bloat some feature requests, right? Because if everyone's working on something for four months, we can definitely work on something for one or two months while they, they do that. Um, but we, that's not the right approach. That's not what you want to do. You don't want to become the bloater. You don't want to become the blocker. So what we do instead is we take the new product flow, we put it in a new system. We specifically for us, what we did was that we split it up into a new microservice. We made sure that the new product flow goes through that system. And then first of all, we weren't blockers at all, which meant that they could keep on working and they would have their end-to-end um, -to -end testing when they needed it. And what we did next, or what we're actually going to do next, is we are little by little going to move all the rest of the logic in a way that can be done um, easily and in small pieces. Meaning that I don't have to take out a large loan again. I don't have to be a blocker for others. I don't have to be um, the one who turns people away. What I can do instead is put a cornerstone for this change that I want to make within my system. And once I've done that, when I, once I've put in the cornerstone, I've made a stand. I make sure that everyone goes through that new product flow. I make sure that the next things done, the next feature requests are done with this new state of mind, right? This new evolutionary step that we've taken as a system. Okay, so you've done all that, right? Um, you've thought of a vision and you've communicated it to everyone and everyone is super, super, super psyched. And how do you know that you've succeeded? I see you're laughing at me. That's not very nice. <laughs> okay, um, so like you've, you've communicated it to everyone and, um, and everyone is on the same page and everyone sees a different facet of the problem. And, and so how do you know you've succeeded? How do you know, what is your KPI to know that this is actually working and that you should proceed with what you're doing? So your KPI is when, is when other people outside of your team start to suggest things that are with your vision, that are in line with your vision. So if your manager comes up to you and says, hey, you know, I've heard of that feature request from this other department and they want to do this and I think that we should, in our case, move it to a new microservice and it makes complete sense with the vision, then you know you've won. Then you know you're good because you have other people working on that facet of the problem with you. You've created more allies for that co-evolution. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, all the way in the back. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Not my fault. <laughs> uh, so, uh, quite a touching uh, topic. Uh, so went also through the uh, migration from the monolith to microservices uh, and got a few comments. So when you let the product owners make technical decision, architectural decisions, or involve them into architectural decisions, that's usually a bad choice. It ends uh, badly, at least uh, in, in my experience. Uh, the other thing that's is not a, a question. Yes, and another thing about the K KPI. So you asked that about- That could end badly. <laughs> About the KPI, so uh, what you actually would recommend uh, as a KPI? I have an answer for myself, but it's, it's, inter it's interesting what's your opinion about it. For, what do you mean? Uh, for uh, success of the changes that are uh, being uh, executed. So how to measure that uh, the changes which are you proposed and which happened, uh, they are successful. What kind of KPI would you propose? I think if you're able to evolve, if you're not stuck, if you're creating a system that is constantly being able to evolve, if the next feature request that comes in, if it doesn't scare you, 
And if it doesn't have you running for the hills, not you and not the product manager and not the engineering manager, then you know you're good. What you're looking to do is you're looking to step out this, um, uh, this state of mind of fear of like, oh my God, the next feature request is gonna come in and like, oh shit, like what, what, what are they gonna ask for, for me to do next? If, you step, if you've stepped out of that, then you're good. Cool, so if you summarize, that's basically a speed of delivery of their features or easiness or predictability. Um, I mean, predictability is a bit hard because it's, it's unpredictable, but um, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, not, it's not just the ease of change, but it's also the ecosystem of the people around you that you've created with it. I mean, it's not, it's not just that your system is able to change, it's that the people actually, the people around you are not afraid of that change. They're not afraid of your system. It's not like this big black box that no one talks about or no one comes in. Your team is not the um, like, oh my God, don't go in there type team. It's, it's that you were actually able to create a collaborative space. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, here. Can you throw it? Wow. Uh, thank you uh, for the talk. Uh, question is, you said in the beginning, you were, when, when you joined, you were told, but meta site for every change. What specifically do you do that it's not becoming but vision uh, now? So what if, what if you have a change that doesn't really fit or it's it's artificial to fit it into the vision that there is. So how do you, how do you change the vision, I mean? Or do you, really, uh, do you again need six weeks next time if uh, there is a, I don't know, some change that doesn't really fit? So it really, it really depends on my opinion. If, um, if the change that you're being asked to do is something that has matured, meaning that the people actually know what they want and they have data to prove that that's where they're going, right? And it's not a POC, it's not something that they're trying out, it's not something you want them to hack around and figure it out, then it seems as though it's mature enough for you to rethink your vision, right? It seems that it's important enough to stop and think how that fits into what you're doing and whether or not you need to make any changes with where you're going. Thank you. Now, I know it's, it's probably there is no definite answer to that, but my question but that I had in my head that if there was a system that worked and then you need several weeks to find a vision to change it, and now I would be afraid that next time someone else after four years <laughs> will say, oh, that vision is crap. Uh, let's, let's make another vision. I mean, how, but, probably but the, the question the was, idea how do you handle continuous change of the vision on, or how many people can be involved or uh, what did you, how did you deal with the conflict in, in the vision? Because it's generic, but it's still, it's still rigid. It still mm -hmm. tries to force you in one direction. That's the question. So what we did is that we focused, with, within our team, we focused on the different problems that we had. I mean, the f first of all, what we did was simply define the problems, make sure that we all understood the problems. After that, it's a matter of thinking about the different technological solutions, the different implementations, options, and for that, it is a really specific technical discussion. I mean, it's like, you know, I could have a bunch of microservices or I could have materialized views over Kafka. It, it depends, you know? Um, but the whole idea of this vision, the whole idea of this, this, um, this, way of working is that you don't stop every four years. You make a pit stop along the way. Like you don't stay at a hotel. You don't take a flight to Amsterdam once every four years. You make pit stops along the way in order to make sure that you're still looking at, um, at small changes in order to make sure that you remain flexible both here and in your code. That's how you keep that flexibility. It's that you don't stop once every four years, you stop every quarter, 
You stop every time someone comes in with a, um, with a new idea, with a big product change they want to make, with a new technological advancement, with um, the, some industry trend that people want to implement within the company. It, every time something big happens, you need to stop and figure out how that affects where you're going. Okay, thank you. You may applause. <laughs> Karen, hold on. <laughs>